So welcome everybody. Um, Mila, I just have, would like you to introduce the conference uh, that, we're, that we're speaking at and, um, and then I will take the pleasure of in introducing this fantastic, um, incredible panel. Thank you, Julene, and welcome everybody, our panelists, our participants, and everybody that is listening to us on live Facebook and YouTube. The, I am Mila Popovic, and I am head of the research and development on the project of global leadership in the 21st century by the World Academy of Art and Science and United Nations in Geneva. Um, I'm also a member um, of the executive committee and chair of the nominations committee. But in this panel, I'm particularly showing up as an artist um, and a social artist and the founder and director of Evolving Leadership, which is transformative program and practice on the scale of personal, organizational, and planetary social change and transformation. So with that introduction, I'm really happy to be here with a group of practitioners, social artists, um, and transformers. Um, it has been a wonderful process of collaborating with my friend and colleague, Julene Sadiq, who has her own practice of which she will speak to you today. Um, and to think together of what kind of forum we wanted to bring forward into the discussion of global leadership. I will just alert you to one key difference here, that global leadership is understood as a collective way of responding to the challenges that humanity is facing today. So leadership as such is understood as a social process of collective solution generation rather than just nurturing individual leading figures. That's a, that's a key part of it, uh, as much as it is practi practices, ideas, movements that are also leaders um, in this domain. But we are primarily focused on transformative strategies that are necessary to accelerate mobilization of collective that is global leadership that is capable to take us into the next stage of human development in the next paradigm. In Thank that you, spirit, Julene Sadiq will introduce our panel, and I am happy to open the forum on behalf of the World Academy and the United Nations. Thank you very much, Mila, and I'm really honored to be with such a fantastic group of women and incredible practitioners. Um, we've brought together a very diverse panel because I think the arts in general have not been completely understood and utilized in the context of um, development, in the context of bringing, understanding the diverse modes of transformative practice, be them clinical, be them medical, be them artistic, be them social. So this panel really seeks to demonstrate and bring to the forefront all these different ways of engaging uh, with the arts. Um, so I don't want to take too much time. With that, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Kathy Malchiotti, who is the director of the Expressive um, our tra trauma-informed practice institute. So Kathy, we we're going to be doing seven to 10 minutes each, and then we'll be taking uh, questions from the audience. So without further ado, Kathy, please um, tell us about the role of arts in, in personal and trauma transformation. And you will tell me if I go over time, but I've tried to keep this to <laughs> under 10 minutes. Um, but thank you, Julianne, for putting all this together and I'm just so honored to be able to give this short presentation and uh, let me do a screen share here while I'm talking so that we get that all taken care of and I do have a little short films here so I'm going to try to optimize this um, hold on there we go um, so yeah I'm an expressive arts therapist I'm also a psychologist and um, it's really an honor to share with everyone a little bit about how the arts uh, from ev evidence-based work and also from culture are making a difference in the recovery around the world with trauma. Uh, and this includes our current times and pandemic. And also if people are following the news, they're well aware that we have a lot of social unrest right now in the United States, but that is reflected around the world. And people are using the arts in this way to be able to address this. Um, so art, expressive arts therapy is interesting, speaking essentially to Geneva. In Switzerland, actually, there's one of the oldest expressive arts therapy 
uh, graduate programs and doctoral programs in the world. It's at the European Graduate School. So it's kind of interesting to be talking essentially virtually to Switzerland right now, because that's kind of a ground zero for this practice. Expressive arts therapy essentially is a purposeful use of movement, music, image making, so art making, performance, writing, and play and imagination all mixed together in really a lot of different sectors. So in healthcare, in psychotherapy and mental health, and just in general wellness practices that communities might engage in. So it's very diverse in terms of where it's practiced which includes education as well. So we see a lot of this in education. Oops, trying to get my slide to go forward here. Um, so what the basis of expressive arts therapy is when we think about it with trauma is the fact that neuroscience over the last 10 to 15 years has really taught us that in order to address trauma, talking is not enough. It's just not enough to help people fully recover and repair from what is troubling them, what's distressing their body. So it's really taught us that we need to use the senses. And the arts are all about the senses. They really capitalize on all the senses, which include visual, which include hearing, tactile, all these kinds of things. We've found now through evidence are really the starting point for trauma repair and recovery. So even in my mind, even though I'm quite biased because I use this as my main practice, using words alone and just talking with people is often not enough. It's really becoming now well understood that this is a fundamental way to address trauma in individuals and communities, so groups of people. And this is all ages. Sometimes people are thinking already that it has to only do with children, no. It's actually my work has to do with a lot of adults, uh, mostly in the military right now who are recovering from post-traumatic stress. But when I say that neuroscience is helping us understand the expressive arts as a practice, we also have to acknowledge another thread here that's evidence. And that's that cultures have regulated themselves throughout time, throughout thousands of years, using these kinds of artistic rituals, conventions, procedures, and ceremonies really to respond directly to trauma and loss. So our evidence is not just in the brain. There are many studies now that point to how these things work through neuroscience and neurobiology, but our main evidence is actually cultural anthropology and ethnology because humans have always used these practices to return to psychological, physical and social equilibrium. So you can see here in this picture, all the art forms and more that I haven't even included on here. But when we look to that, we have the real evidence actually that these practices are what we need in order to resolve trauma. Um, another piece that I've been looking at, and this is just my personal research, is thinking about how these practices fall into different categories because we, we do have visual art, we have music, we have drama, we have dance, but all these things fall actually and overlap sometimes into some really universal healing practices throughout time. And I've broken these down, and this is what I wanna share with you for the rest of this short presentation, that they fall into movement practices, practices that involve sound, practices that involve storytelling, and practices that involve silence, which are more contemplative, regulating, and meditative. So that's what I really have been looking at and how these practices are helping people to recover. So I'm just gonna take you quickly here through these four practices with a little bit of example. Some of the examples very contemporary right now. But when we look at movement, we think of dancing. Dancing certainly is a core practice in movement that has been helpful for people to resolve and repair trauma. We also have practices like yoga. And yoga, of course, has been around for thousands of years. Cross cultures, we have energy arts, tai chi, qigong, Akedo. We can look also at cultural practices such as the hula, sun dance, which is a practice in the US among our indigenous populations, corroboree, which is in Australia. So these are really experiences that involve self-soothing repetition, familiarity. They connect people to each other. And I just want to see if I can share a short film here. This is very recent, and if a lot of you are familiar, we've 
had a lot of unrest right now in the U.S. due to the death of a man named George Floyd uh, in some incident of pr police brutality. But around the world, this has triggered people to get together and uh, essentially advocate, but they're advocating through their own cultural practices in order to honor this individual and also to be active. This is the Maori and in New Zealand. This is a response to the death of the and the racial protest. I think this is remarkable. This is what's happening throughout the world. People are going to be globally to express solidarity and also do it for their own healing and social and physical equilibrium. So that's just one short example there, but you'll, if you went on the internet and looked up some of the things that are going on in terms of protests and advocacy, we're seeing lots of different art forms being used to come out into the world and express what is going on and what people are feeling and sensing. So, you know, research wise, we know that common art experiences like music and drumming and singing, chanting are all very effective in trauma repair and recovery. So the neuroscience proves this, but the cultural existence of it for thousands of years, I think, is the real evidence that we still use these practices. So sound is an interesting one because music actually is the only art form that uses the entire brain and activates the entire brain. And we probably know the most about music as a, as a remedy for trauma because it can lift you out of depression. Also, if you are depressed, it enlivens you. It also brings back memories. It's also a powerful pain reducer. So if we think about sound, we can think about singing, drumming, playing instruments. We've got humming. about one minute, Kathy, just giving you okay. a heads up. <laughs> wow, that went by fast. So we have here a little bit of what happened in Notre Dame. So people get together to do these practices. here then because I do want to share this one which is storytelling which uh, you can see here this is the cover of a magazine in the US that's just going to come out next week uh, artist uh, Kadir Nelson for the New Yorker and imagery has always been a popular and powerful way to tell stories it stimulates and enhances memory it also helps people talk more about what happened. We know that now that if we do a simple drawing, we're liable to tell two to three times more language than talking alone. So silence, I'm not gonna go into because we don't have time, but the expressive arts are a natural relaxant. That's the thing we know from neuroscience. But again, these things have existed over time. And just one last thing, because this is very important. When people are looking for a trauma remedy or something to help repair, the biggest evidence has come from the people themselves. When given a choice of treatments, talk, all kinds of things, patients repeatedly choose forms of self-expression because they cite improvement in their own quality of life and well-being. So I think that's probably the most powerful evidence of all that people return to it. So thank you. Sorry I went over. <laughs> So thank much you. Thank Let me it's get a, out it's of a very um, well-rounded introduction, so we really appreciate that. I mean, yeah. definitely from uh, clinical studies of music therapy to music from antiquity to modern day to all these use of arts in cultural practice, very important. So what I would like to go to next is Dorota Stanchek, um, who is a transformational artist. And what interests me about her work is her ability to take these therapeutic techniques, these personally transformative techniques, and really create some very immersive, uh, transformative artistic experiences. So it'd be good to hear from Dorota, you as an artist, how you take these transformative techniques into an artistic practice. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, I'm so privileged and grateful to be here and share my experience and to talk to you from perspective of being an artist and I, before I even get to what is transformative art and I how can I use it uh, in order to transform people I would like to give you a little bit of background how even 
it all started for me uh, and how, what did I discover in art industry that led me to move into transform transformative arts. So I'm gonna share with you a little presentation. Here we go. So first of all, my background started in, I started in visual arts over 13 years ago. And this is some of the images you can see. So it was highly aesthetic art. I work in the fashion industry, mu movie industry, music industry, and all sort of industry related to, to beauty. And after that, I was really involved in social art and I created a social art movement um, in 2013 that was basically communicating integration from all the people from all around the world. So this is a t-shirt, it's a real t-shirt that were actually, uh, that had a picture imprinted on them. And when you stand in a specific location, um, it basically makes you united with the background. So you would buy such a t-shirt and with the GPS coordinate, you will go to the specific location and you will be united with, uh, with the world. So sewn into the world was a, was a movement that was exploring the liberty, equality, integration, union between people and the world. And this project was, uh, it took us around three years to, to, to actually uh, create. And it was completed in Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia. And that uh, path uh, really um, led me to, to, to think that art can be so much more than just what we perceive. And I end up in the actually wellness industry after, after uh, years in, uh, spending years in visual arts. And just for, the, for you guys to know that wellness economy is four, hundred, uh, four and a half trillion market. So it's something that people really underestimate. Um, I started to work with a company that is called Mind Valley, that is one of the biggest um, digital publishing houses um, and represents authors and speakers and experts from all around the world. So I work with one, um, some of the biggest uh, researcher, neuroscientists, uh, um, monks, and and really people in the wellness industry that that um, work uh, to to create um, a massive change and shift of perception, shift of, of awareness, and uh, transformation. So we not only created the programs and courses, we also created um, transformational events. So I collaborated with an amazing team of people as a creative director and we work on a creating really five, four days events that would combine talks, knowledge, that would combine art, that would combine uh, all those uh, transformational practices, including breath, or, uh, breath techniques, yoga, um, dance, ecstatic dance, and all sorts of different um, really methodologies in order to bring people the deepest transformation. And that would be great, but I asked myself, well, how can we really um, scale it? So I realized that what was the most transformational uh, in that research was, was really uh, what was bringing uh, the biggest transformation was human and unusual interactions, really putting people out of their comfort zone, uh, asking them to do really unfamiliar tasks. Uh, guided transformative exercises, transformative technology, uh, transformative sound, light, imagery, and the knowledge and insight. So, of course, it's, it's, it's easy to pay, you know, a uh, few thousands of dollars and go to such an event and have a transformation, but many of people can't really afford that. So how can we scale this transformation? I looked into two industry. Uh, I looked in the transformative technology industry because that is e easily scalable. And I look into art industry. So first I did my research basically studying the transformative technology that exists there. Uh, what you can see here is 40 years of Zen te technology that um, basically designed by Dave Asprey. And is a technology that allows us to create a permanent shift in our brain um, that will be equivalent of 40 years of meditation. So basically in the five days, uh, they are able of recreating neural pathways and training our brain to have the same effect as if it, we were meditating for 40 years. It's highly revolutionary, but also highly expensive. Another technology you saw was Mikey Siegel technology. Uh, Mikey is, is very well known in, in Bay Area for transformative technology. And he basically um, does a lot of research and art performances on creating... Two minutes, just letting you know. 
perfect, on synchronizing people's hearts, synchronizing people's brainwaves. So all of that, um, uh, my question was always how we can scale it. You have short study here on that basically just represents you what kind of uh, differences in the brain you can you can have after 10 minutes of, of meditation only. So arts and trans transformation. When I looked back uh, in a day in the basically art industry, I realized that we have a lots of uh, interactive art. For example, here at uh, Art Vive, um, that is a great movement and a great example of interaction interactive art. We have a uh, Refik Anadol, we have um, Olafur Aliasson. These are absolutely incredible artists or wisdom and that was created in Los Angeles that is basically a space for transformation. Uh, but there is not really a transformation happening. So my question is, um, imagine transformational art experiences, movie and exhibition that can, through different creative expression, interactive technology, upgrade our level of consciousness. So this is my biggest life passion and the biggest question. So imagine life events that involve sensory, auditory, vibrational, energetic, and visual experiences that can shift our perception, awareness, and enhance our experience of being a human. Now, how is that possible? So first of all, what is available? We have a VR technology, we have a mind movement. One minute, one minute. 360 sound system technology, um, we have a heart coherence technology, brainwaves technology, sight simulation, and so on. So what is already proven that all of those have really tremendous uh, basically impact on our uh, parasympathetic nervous system, can regulate our blood pressure, vision, and all sorts of uh, functions in our body. So basically to summarize, Transformational um, artistic practices, in my opinion, can now happen unless we include the technology and we include interaction, which I uh, mentioned from before. So by creating those, the, the, those kind of events and experiences when people in a very short period of time can experience themselves and interact with themselves, that can actually really create um, so-called not um, symbolic persistent shift of consciousness. So this is my biggest passion. This is what I work on and what I'm researching. I'm working on technologies worldwide with um, many of different um, experts. And, and this is where, uh, where I'm heading right now. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope uh, you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Jarocha. It's beautiful to see the, the uh, the diversity between, you know, all the ancient practices and how we can use technology for really immersive, transformative experiences, hitting all these key processes, um, both physical and psychological. So well done. Um, I'd like to move now more into, you know, the social impact side, as well as if you want to, uh, with uh, Nadine. Nadine, if you want to uh, open your presentation, um, while I introduce you, Nadine uh, it works with a fantastic organization called Beautiful Trouble, who are a toolkit for revolution, making revolution irresistible. And they've created an incredible toolkit for diversity of artistic practices in the global north, but as well recently, Beautiful Rising is um, artistic practices and social movements all across the global south that have really played a role in catalyzing the effectiveness of social movements. So. I'll hand it over to you, Nadine. Thank you so much. Just want to really thank you, uh, Julian and Mila, for having me here. I'm going to go very, very quickly through this. You've already told everyone what Beautiful Trouble is. I'm going to just talk um, one more second about what we, the whole spectrum of things that we offer. We call it a toolkit. We do everything from jam sessions and trainings to offer, re which are, and lots of resources online, which are free, as well as things that are very affordable and available in multiple languages from books to card decks and strategy uh, packs and things like that. So just, I'm going to keep really going. The interesting piece about, I guess, where all this work intersects about how arts and culture can have direct impact on social transformation is that we do start with the stories. As was mentioned, they're extraordinarily powerful, but we do not stop there. In fact, we take people's own words and stories and help them pull out the principles and theories and the tactics that are key to their effectiveness. And by doing that, we help people then acknowledge or assess whether or not they can be useful in their own context, if there's something there. So very practically, I'm gonna run through a few examples from current events, if you will. 
one of the basic jobs of an artist, of a cultural worker, is to make the invisible visible often. In these two examples, one is from last week in uh, the United States, in Virginia, a projection artist projecting the image of Harriet Tubman onto a statue of a Confederate uh, general. The other one is a picture of a video that was projected in London with uh, health workers first person videos about how COVID and the pandemic was affecting them, making the uh, making, making it accessible for people to work on. The same thing is in the United States, we have a little bit of an issue where our government has been, and particularly in the beginning, refusing to acknowledge the cost of the pandemic on its peoples. And so artists put together props, body bags, fake body bags, and laid them both at the White House and at the Trump Hotel making the problem visible so that then people could actually address it. Um, and it also, as you might know, offers a lot of uh, different ways for people to become involved. This is an example of a street mural in Seattle. You may see that all over the country, people are turning to this uh, activist standard and, you, and even governments are, are doing murals on streets. This is a way to incorporate a huge diversity of folks in this process. So one of the cardinal uh, pieces or the answers to how do we actually transform a society is that we need to move people out of their minds and into their bodies to be fully emotive and fully engaged. We need to provide many ways for people to interact at a very basic level or at a very high level. So that's one example. Here's another one. And they, we have direct impact. Like people may be aware that across the United States, we're having direct impact on regulations and laws that are changing how policing is done and what kind of officers are placed in schools and what kind of authority they have to respond. This is another street mural example where a number of people participated in painting this in front of Jeff Bezos' house in Washington, DC. He's probably the richest man in the world. We were asking for basic protections for Amazon workers and uh, for uh, in the, during the pandemic. Another thing to just really acknowledge is, uh, and this is from um, eight to abolition groups working on defunding the police and abolishing the police, that this kind of graphic representation, the involvement of trained graphic professionals and visual artists can help um, explain and move complicated conversations into the realm where many people can understand them and use them and integrate them into their lives. As mentioned, you know, well, we also have sound that mobilizes people. And in this case, the Casarolasas, which is a traditional noise making protest, has been done all over the world to build community. When people couldn't leave their houses, they banged their pots and pans and sang from their balconies, and also to um, register resistance. And then people would know that we could, that there were neighbors and others who were working on the same issues. Just really quickly put this in here. This is images from Brazil. A group in Brazil was trying to bring the problem home to urban centers of the destruction of the Amazon. And by using famous musicians and perf uh, performers, they were able to bring the, the, um, the fan base along to make the issue personal to them. And so this was a, an example of a a concert series that had to go online because of the pandemic, but it made these connections very valuably. Another thing that we think about with arts and taking it out of the high tech zone or combining it with high tech and low tech is these are individual images that were made by people producing letters, in one case for indigenous populations in Canada, and to make a poster that was put together by a graphic designer. And on the other hand, by people sending in images of their hands um, to bring forward the understanding that the outcome of the pandemic is up to us. And this idea that simple rules can have grand results, small contributions can add up to a big hole, has been very valuable in getting people involved. Wanted to put this one in here just to talk about the power of comics and cartoons. The image is that we use in art to communicate complicated messages. And another example of sort of bringing both of that together is that in Denmark, they had a big plan for an action, one big rally around refugees. And they had to cancel it because of COVID and the pandemic. And what they did is they went um, into small communities in everyone's homes. Everyone made their own image and got and hung this one out. One minute, one minute. It was incredibly beautiful and powerful. So I think the last thing I'm going to share is this idea that we can put in place the future that we want, prefigurative. This is from the UK, people putting in place the bike lanes that they think should exist, both because this is a current example from the pandemic, people are afraid to be on public transportation, but also because um, 
you know, this is a way to address climate change and the bigger pandemic of fossil fuels consumption. And you can see from this that um, you can actually put in place the future that you want. Very briefly, I'm going to apologize for this uh, academic slide here, but there are easily identifiable at least six strategic functions of art and culture in resistance movements. And this is what takes all the internal transformation work, the ordinary uh, community involvement, and actually makes it accessible, meaningful, and uh, builds our people power to make real change. And we've seen all over the world real change happening from people power movements that have been supercharged by using arts and culture. Um, whether it's to motivate, whether it's to offer actual constructive programs or create space and promote group consciousness. So um, just I'll end there uh, with a, just a note that these resources are online and we really encourage you to get in touch and help us, um, you know, analyze and move this conversation into broader use around the world to mobilize and general, generate uh, social transformation for progressive causes. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nadine, that was beautiful. I think what stands out is that art is a language and a means to which people turn to, making the invisible visible, but also a way to reinvent and even draw out you know, what they want. So I think that's really fantastic um, to highlight the social uses. Gabby, we're gonna move to you real quickly. I think you have some very powerful examples. Um, um, Gabby works with art and peacemaking, but she's also um, a part of a fantastic network of some real arts, artists and art organizations for, that are making very big changes to communities. So I'll hand it over to you to share your um, examples and experiences. Thank you, Jillian. Let me share my screen with you. Uh, okay, here we are. Okay, I uh, will start talking about my experience as a founder of TAP Foundation. TAP Foundation is an organization that we created 12 years ago in Latin America to use art and social innovations to change the pattern of violence in our communities. I came from Latin America and in our countries, the rate of homicide is the higher rate of homicides in the world. Most of our young people believe that their future is became part of a gang, especially in vulnerable communities. And we use art to change that reality for them. And how we do it is changing the pattern of violence with the whole community, starting with the moms. And this is one of the first stories that I want to share with you. If I go to a community, and that, this was my personal experience when we started this work, my oldest daughter has six months old. And I imagine myself going to a community to say to every mom, you are not raising well your child because you can punish them. I thinking about what I feel if someone came to me to tell me that I'm not a good mom. You know, this is the way that I know how to do it. And we create a program uh, using art to Imagine with the moms the way that they want to be seen by their children. And we ask the children to draw uh, how they feel when their mom's hidden. And we share it with the moms. And everything starts to change in the communities. And the moms understand that the normalization of violence is not good for their children. And they start to change the way they raise their children. And that, be, that creates a movement of moms in this community in Venezuela that right now have more than 12,000 moms that share ideas through art, through draw, to training programs, to share with other moms how they can raise their children without violence and how they can protect them in their communities. In one of our communities, we have uh, around 100 and 120 uh, sexual harassment in the schools. It, the, the children was walking to the school and they were attacked in the process. And the moms create the movement to protect them based on this worship. And other moms start to pay to protect their children. And right now, this is the way they live. You know, they receive money to do that. They're using art not, not only as a way to have a more peaceful or more uh, uh, beautiful coexistence is practical because they are earning money, the money that they need to uh, feed their children, but they are also protecting them 
and they are creating a better community for all. And this program has right now nine years and it works very well. And the rate of sexual harassment right now in the community is zero in the last nine years. That is just one example. We have another example uh, with young people. Uh, we use photography and video to teach the young people how to change the image that they have about themselves and about their communities and to start to create the possibility for them. Most of the children know if they uh, finish the, if they don't finish the school, they will end in the gangs, you know, and some of them don't want to be part of a gang. They don't want to be murderers. They don't want to be drug dealers. They want to do something different. More of them are very creative people and they want to be an artist. But in a developing country, being an artist is a challenge because most of the, most of the artists don't receive any support for the government. We don't have budget for arts in Latin America. We need to figure out how to do it. Well, we started to work with these children and we create a program working with private companies to train these kids as a photographers, as a videographers, uh, as a filmmakers. Uh, and these companies start to uh, invite them to be part of their company. And right now we have 200 children who were part of the gang and they changed their gun for uh, cameras and right now are journalists. Some of them work with the majorities of their communities, are the photographers of the majority. Some of them are working in TV channels. Some of them are doing uh, worship for other children in their communities, but they understand that there is a possibility, a real possibility to use art, not only as a static tool, also to change their reality. The same money that they earn uh, doing uh, drug dealing in their community is the same money that they earn selling a photograph uh, using any platform that they can have access. And uh, in other uh, example that I want to share with you, my last example, because I know we don't have too much time, we realize that it's not possible to us as organization to, the, to do this by our own. Not Imagine the biggest organization around the world can change things by themselves. We understand that we need to teach teachers, parents, other organizations, governments, companies, and create a network of people aware the power of art has. Of course, art is important, and we already have two uh, amazing presentations about that for healing, for trauma uh, overcoming, for uh, advocacy, or you know, to highlight the problem that we are facing. But also, art is a tool. It's a powerful tool to change the patterns of relation that we have in our community, to change inequality, to allow the children to develop their own potential. You know, not only because ne neuroscience, uh, the neuroscience have proof about what happened in the brain of a children when they have access to art, it's also because we can change the way that we relation with other people if we learn how to use art and how to be more empathic or more tolerant or change the way that we understand other people. And that is what we are creating with this network. Right now we have an incredible group of artists, um, visual artists, people from theater, uh, people from music industry, uh, people from advertising uh, agencies who are willing to support this movement. And this movement is not trying to create a campaign is trying to make change where the people live in the most vulnerable communities around the world. If right now I can see the faces of these 12,000 moms and they told me, I'm not hitting my children anymore. My work with art is done. That is much more powerful for me than a campaign in social network because that means that these 12,000 children have a new opportunity in life. And I have 12,000 potential murder less in Latin America. And that's what we try to do with our foundation and with our network of supporters. Thank you, Yelene. And thank you all for being here with us. Thank you so much. Mila, maybe you'd like to introduce Koga and make some. I am just, uh... 
blown away by the scope of these concentric circles of impact that we are constantly seeing the showcasing of, of everything that we've heard so far and I'm looking forward to hearing from, from the rest of the panel. What we are seeing is the correlated process of inner transformation with social artistry that the, at, the, at the center, at the source of these multiple you know, uh, uh, waves of concentric circles of impact is the shift in consciousness coupled with new cultural code, the new meme, the co cultural meme that we are imbuing, not a artist, that we are unleashing the social artistry in everybody in the way we relate to self, to our own voice, to sense of self-significance and sense of possibility of self-giving and contribution in the world. Then it goes in the way of educating, in the way of parenting, in the way of engaging all others or otherized identities in a variety of contexts. And then it keeps like a wave, I said, of, of impact um, expressing out while at the same time saturating the social fabric with richness of art with unleashing of the artistic expression of all and imbuing the social field with trust, with trust in the significance of our voices, of our self-expression. It redignifies every human being while also nourishes that being. And especially in countries where there is lack of uh, systems of care and support, and it varies. I mean, you can have the most powerful economy and military in the world like the US that absolutely has a social fabric depleted. And this is where we're now seeing uh, um, the reactions in the yes. streets. People are showing up together. And on the other hand, you can see things of which Gabby is talking about. We have no cultural programs. We have nothing invested, you know, but we have to self-organize. So on any spectrum of depre depletion of soil or soul or society, we see people self-organizing and then re-energizing each other through self-expression that also expands into full social impact. I'm amazed, and this is my snippet of connecting everything that I've heard and so eager to hear the rest. And also, of course, listening to Julene's deep practice to see how we can scale all this out, <laughs> scale all this out for the benefit of all. Thank you, Julene. Thank you. Um, I'll just say two minutes about what I do, and then I really want to hear from Tia, Tia Hoga. So um, in the next panel, we're going to be bringing this, this out into the wider cultural systemic field, right, of what we're dealing with. Um, and in particular, I, I mean, I've worked as a therapist, an artist, a scientist, and um, seen the value of art for hidden transcripts, things that um, are not able to be said otherwise, for social transformation in communities. And I've asked this question, you know, why don't we have structures that actually support that process? Okay, so we invest in military, we invest in finance, we don't, in, but that is a demonstration of values. That is not a demonstration of actual evidence of what is going on. In fact, I think it demonstrates the disconnect sometimes between our larger institutional governmental structures and what the people themselves are capable of what the people instill the ingenuity and resourcefulness and creative creative practice that they generate their expression through so my work has been to to play a role in creating a new structure in particular for the music industry and um, as Kathy mentioned music is a whole brain activity so I call it musical nutrition right filling the information gap to the music industry so just as in the food industry we didn't even have food labels until the fda released them in the 90s the 90s is not that long ago and after the introduction of food labels where you see what is in food then we create diets now we even have superfood now we have we can solve obesity just because the information was there so musical nutrition is about giving that to the music industry, profiling benefit processes, profiles profiling sonically, sonic information in music so that we can say now, um, you know, do you realize that there are a million people listening to music in this way for these reasons, receiving this type of benefit so they can get something new written or use something in their back catalog? 
because what we're dealing with is a habituation and practice of the music industry and also just a lack of knowledge of this. You know, music industry is coming from the productization of music, selling music as a product sold and bought. This same could be a liberal, neoliberal influence, productization, consumerized understanding, which is actually working against the arena of possibilities. So by creating our uh, musical nutrition technology, which enables a, a benefit-based music distribution, a mode, a technology for music to be recatalyzed according to benefit and benefit process. We open up to cross industries in healthcare. We open up to cross industries in the development sector and creating that support system, which we have, we have had all the knowledge for centuries about this type of practice, but now it's the question of values and institutionalizing those values for real transformative impact. So with that, I want to hand it over to Tia Hoga because I know she's done fantastic fantastic work with um, Earth Day in Mexico, and I know she's a fantastic filmmaker herself with Bellini and has utilized art in her organization. So I want to lead it over to you and say, you know, why did you choose to use arts in your organization and what do you feel the role and the impact is? Should more organizations, you know, in that sector work that way? Um, over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm greeting you from Mexico City. I presently coordinate Earth Day Network for Mexico, and we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, uh, which means that for the last 50 years, we have been working on creating awareness and education on the situation of planet Earth. 50 years ago, we already knew that we had climate change, that we were losing biodiversity, and it is really amazing that it has taken us 50 years <laughs> to understand <laughs> that we really are in trouble. And I think the, the present COVID uh, situation uh, in a way is bringing us to that point. I mean, we, I think this is a very clear example of what happens when life support systems deteriorate and uh, how we are really part of this biosphere. So uh, I have been very much involved in environment ever since I was a child. I grew up in a beautiful valley in Mexico called Tepoztlan, which is full of nature and uh, also uh, indigenous people. And coming from a European family, you know, I, have st I started since a very small child to bring awareness about the importance of nature. And uh, I have tried all my life to bring different ways uh, of, of making people aware of the importance and the beauty of nature. So um, uh, I have started many different environmental organizations, but have specialized in environmental education, information, and communication. And um, First of all, I think um, the beauty of nature itself and bringing people closer to nature and showing them the, the beauty and the art of nature, you know, how the perfect functioning of nature, the, the beauty of a tree, the beauty of a bird, the beauty of our incredible biodiversity uh, and being close to nature is a, a very, very important part, you know, of bringing, of showing this art of nature, this amazing uh, beauty. And then uh, I have worked very, for many, many years in film because I've always asked myself, how, how can children, how can adults, how can society understand more about nature? So I studied film with Federico Fellini and uh, he showed me how you know, we can really show extraordinary things and exaggerate them so that people really take them in, you know, and use colors. And, um, and this I have transformed into filmmaking uh, in um, trying to, you know, I've made documentaries and feature films, but I've always tried to use the beauty of it, you know, not make 
documentaries that would just focus on information, but documentaries that actually would show, would get to the senses, to the emotions, so that people could really connect to, to this beauty and to the biodiversity and become a bird or become a tree or, you know, really put uh, people into the shoes of nature. Become a tree, you know, become a bird, become a dolphin and try to understand how do they feel, you know, how, how for example, now that the oceans are so polluted. I mean, imagine if you were a dolphin, how would you feel that suddenly your ocean is so polluted and that you, you don't know what you should eat and what you shouldn't, you know? I mean, we as humans are asking ourselves, well, I'm sure the dolphins and all fish, you know, they see all these particles swim, swimming around and I'm sure they are connecting and they are asking themselves, okay, what is making me sick? What is not making me sick? And I think we are in a big evolution uh, as a biosphere. And I personally think that this uh, pandemic is giving us the opportunity to reappreciate nature. And I really, really hope that we, evol we grow in an evolution and in, in the beauty and appreciation of the art of the, our biosphere and reconnect with nature in a, in a very different way. And I think, uh, you know, I feel very fortunate to have coordinated in Mexico the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and bring the awareness that we have been doing this for 50 years. So I think it's time to really go one step further and uh, really feel ourselves part of this biosphere and our incredible role that we have to, to get into a new sphere, which would be the sphere, the noosphere, the sphere of intelligence, in which we connect the biosphere, the biological world, with a technology that doesn't destroy nature, and that brings us into a sphere of intelligence in which we can really get into a new stage of humanity. Beautiful. And uh, well, I think this is what I would like to convey, you know, to, to really bring all this together and to appreciate the amazing beauty and art of nature into our daily lives. Beautiful. Julene, I would like to invite you to do something, uh, if you don't mind. You spoke about Nada Brahma and your practice in a very powerful way. And I think I've just kind of staged it about the waves of impact. I would invite you to pull up your website and share it with us because I think there's so much to be said that is so captured in it. And as, as we just... carry forward, I, as you are doing that, I would like to ask all of our participants, panelists, to actually read one of very powerful question. Um, actually, we have a couple, and I see that some dear friends, um, participants such as Ranjani Ravi and Witold Kinsner are listening to us. So while Julene is doing that, if you don't mind looking at those questions and also if there's anything else in terms of questions or commentaries in the chat box, and uh, I will share some of my work and what motivates me uh, to do that. Julene, if you're ready, re let me know, and uh, yeah, I will I just, take it from there. I'm uh, just going to put, I'm trying to expand the screen, but I'll just tell you, I mean, essentially what this is about, because what I noticed in between being an artist and scientist and entrepreneur is that there is no shortage of data on the influence of the arts, be it from mm. music antiquity to the modern day, be it from you know, sensory intervention and trauma, be it in the use of catalyzation of social movements throughout the world. What there is a shortage on is, is values, right? Mm. Um, what, what the, and if we are to really bring about systems change, we're talking about new structures which enable um, new values. I'll just, I'll just briefly share my, my screen while I'm doing this. Um, apologies for, 
<laughs> okay, so I can't make this any bigger for some reason, but what mm -hmm. essentially um, this is about, if I'll just go to this page, is that we're, we're unlocking the benefits of, let me just, <laughs> unlocking the benefits of music in an institutionalized way for the music industry, for the healthcare industry. Um, we have videos on our front page, which you can go to, understanding music in the brain, how the nutrition works, um, diagnosing uh, bio, biomarkers from your voice, working with rhythm and activity, the actual um, analyzing of the sonic spectrum of music and what that relates to mood and everything, everything, everything is personalized to you, your personal cultural um, context. Um, so, but what this is about is cross industry skills. Oh no, it's going to start playing the video now. Sorry. <laughs> um, I won't sc screen share too much uh, more because I'm, I don't seem to be very good at that. Um, I don't even know if I, okay. Stop my screen share. But anyways, the point, the point is um, creating the larger infrastructures so that artists don't need to struggle. Okay, creating the larger infrastructures so that, so that art is a viable living. And in the video, I demonstrate the mental health gap, the, the millions of people that are untreated, two thirds are untreated. So our musical chef program is about giving artists tools so they have the right, have tools to be able to be a supportive person to all those people who are in need right changing the spectrum of possibilities also we know we need to catalyze the developmental process for in order to achieve the sustainable development goals so there are plenty of opportunities for artistic tactics um methods um to work in that um in, in that environment to catalyze the methods and tactics and expression of organizations to reimagine, to even draw out on the streets the world that they want. For me, the problem has not been the lack of evidence. Surely, you know, it, when, we, when we see, um, I don't know how to stop screen sharing. I wonder if one of the um, tech people will be able to help me stop screen sharing. Um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, the problem is a shift in values. The, you know, when what we're seeing with, you know, the reason why we don't have arts infrastructures, we have a lot of emphasis on the analytical, on the financial, and we see the disconnect also with people, with, you know, top-down approaches to development, with not even perhaps knowing the range of experience, the range of methods and impact that do exist. And I think about, think, think about this big shift that we're talking about in order to catalyze transformation. Transformation starts with us and it starts with the communities. And this is very much the language for it. So um, what I'm putting forward essentially is a different business model, a prototype so that this can be grounded in practice so that challenges that we see um, can be turned into opportunities because the greatest power of the arts is the ability to handle what I call the dark force. If you transform your trauma or your 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 community's blockages or the you know the community issues like Gabby's doing, there's more light in darkness than there is anywhere. And um, so this is actually, I would say to this person in the Q and A who is asking, how do I get a job? When the world instant recognizes the value of the arts and institutionalizes it, there will be more than enough jobs. We know the gap in mental health. We know the need for social transformation. Now we have to instate those values and institutionalize them so we can really unlock the value of that for people. So that's, um, I'm doing, I'm working on that for the music industry. Um, and um, yeah, and I hope to see many more people creating those systemic innovations. Thank you, Jolene. Um, you bring us forth, uh, you kind of have a summative again moment where you bring us to the question of community. And I would like to take about five minutes to share um, and to appear as an artist, usually in this domain of the World Academy, I'm just nominally an artist. I don't get to uh, share what I'm doing in my communities and across communities, that's what's most important. But uh, because I'm mostly either involved in, in coordinating things or speaking on platforms, which is a different kind of social performance. 
and I don't want to be locked into just one role. So I'll share with you quickly um, a, a little bit of a personal background because it has its, its own, uh, I have my own reasons to do that, which will make sense why this you know, individual into the collective and why the role of a so social artist. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So yes, what yes, I wanted yes. to share with you is this something that I've always um, uh, uh, kind of proponed with everybody because my practice is about unleashing the potential of others as the essence of authentic leadership um, and making, you know, growing the field that you step into and growing everybody that you uh, uh, co-emerge with them, everybody that you come in contact with positively. Um, and my story starts from basically being an immigrant into the U.S. I've lived in the U.S. in Denver, Colorado for 25 years. I've come from a tiny place called Montenegro, which I called a lotus of its own because it's a beautiful, beautiful small country with deep and muddy and complex uh, roots. And I went into the empire of the day. Once I got there, the shock of arrival and the departure um, made me realize not only the traumatic impact of the shift within the certain um, conditions where my na adopted country, US, ended up bombing my native country four or five years after I entered that space. At the same time, what exploded is the capacity of the self to reach out to diversity of communities and in the process to div diversify the self. So. What I've realized, I have even went into my academic work to make it into a therapeutic work and start exploring the migrations, particularly the migrations of women and their writing to derive a certain uh, theory of subjectivity of the diversified self of what I've called being in superposition as that sense of collectivity from within, that the shock of migration uh, tremendously uh, creates a tremendous crisis, but also um, it, it expands enormous possibilities for the ones that have the kind of the psychic stamina and the courage of conviction to show up in these public spaces in certain way. What I've said to everybody else is always that your voice matters, your expression matters, and rather than proponing that, I felt that I need to embody that knowledge and that I need to act accordingly and show up in this new space of, of immigration with that kind of understanding and motivation in multitudes of ways to appeal across intersectionalities of identities in order to mobilize um, a sense of community, a sense of uh, civic empowerment, and I, and I knew subjectivity for the 21st century as a pathway to the new global leadership. So this is the name of my practice and this is where you can find me uh, teaching and, and sharing arts and science of transformation on the personal, organizational, planetary level. So one of the first things that I've done, I went and uh, co-founded, I know, <laughs> it's a little bit of a, a scary image, but it's an image of, of an, a rage that we also see now in the streets all over the world, a rage that says there's no more excuses allowed uh, to, to, shy, to keep us protected from transformation that's no longer serving anybody to stay protected. Rather, we have got to emerge and we have to show up in public spaces together with a sense of healthy outrage. And this is the uh, moment where I've co-founded or actually I was a founding member of a, a company called Transition Theater. It is somewhat in its name self-explanatory and we have worked on, for, on arts for ascension, for expansion of consciousness and recreated an old myth of a, an Indian goddess Kali for the 21st century as a, a modern um, a cyborg goddess, if you will, logically empowered, uh, conscious of its subjectivity in the world and its responsibility and also its capacity to respond to the world, in the world, with the world, and show up to break any barriers or any excuses to emerge together and to create new culture of intimacy in which we are co-evolving as a co-being and co-belonging. These are just some of the images from one of the first um, um, events that we had. Another thing that I've done is I've 
uh, I've uh, partnered up with a global movement called 100,000 Poets for Change that was started in California and that every third week in September, 160 and more cities all over the world organize uh, poetry and art events at the exact same time all over the world uh, to signal what is necessary for social change and to move community fronts for social change. These are some of the ways and dance forms that I practice, such as uh, flamenco, such as Middle Eastern dance. And I want to draw your image particularly to this um, uh, standing in front of the Capitol and actually the court at, in the state of Colorado, because there's an image that is correlated to it. Uh, then I moved on to experimental theater, which was participatory, exploring, experiential, and it was an amazing feeling to be in the crowd of um, communities that came together in the art community on Santa Fe Street. This is my hello to my uh, Denver communities through the, the, the this um, and, and my homage to them. And what we have created has been amazing and that's significant. The next series we have done working with the city of Denver, which is significant because we got to impact the local establishment to work with these communities of artists. And we created a triptych, a series with the transitional transition theater that was about initiatory theater, where we're attending to different faces and phases of collective transformation and individual transformation. And in the next three images, you will hopefully recognize this uh, the, those different thresholds, particularly here of the maiden, the mother that's birthing the earth, and the crone, for example. The impact of working with the city and the state from the base of community involvement of one immigrant single mother <laughs> artist in that community that came speaking of the immigrant discourse and the importance and the richness and the resourcefulness of immigrants countering the current establishment's discourse, is that, as you can see, Colorado's arts industry, recognized on the website of the state of Colorado, contributed $13.7 billion to the state's economy. My point to you is that there is an equality or disparity between the way artists have been sustained or compensated for and supported and their contribution, which is an imbalance that we have to address. And I finally want to tell you that in the current demonstration and pro pro protests for universal values and value of all human voice, of all human expression and every life that matters as we fight for Black Lives Matter. It is the very communities of artists, which makes me very emotional that I worked with that are now in the streets of Denver. The leaders of these movements are actually artists that I've personally worked with and collaborated with. And if you remember the stairs where I stood earlier at the Capitol. This is the new social performance that I was a part of recently to show up in the public space this way. So I will quickly just say that, you know, to, to be an immigrant, to be showing up in the public space with your co-creators is so important to understand that we are diversified selves and a collectivity within and to maximize with artistic expression on that to create tremendous impacts because we have things to show as everybody in this panel has shown profound transformational impact on their immediate communities as well as creating a larger global way for global leadership. Julian. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mila. Um, I just want to thank you know everybody um, for for contributing and and making space for for everyone and showing the sort of variety of practices you know that there are. Um, and I think you know we had one uh, well, there's another, there's another <laughs> session starting, but um, with Whittle, well, the, there was one question about arts and education um, that Janine, I just- I'm just gonna note quickly, I think we can go uh, for 30 minutes, so this would be the time for conversation. I kindly ask that the two questions that are posed in Q&A, we don't have that many. There was um, Whittle's comment as well as Ranjani's that we look into that and we please uh, address those and please open it to, to um, our wonderful social artists in the panel to discuss these questions. Yeah, I mean, I think Wittold's question was about, you know, there's, there's this new educational framework called STEAM, right? So besides science, technology, including arts as well. And um, how can we, 
I mean, I can't see the question anymore, but you know, how can we better incorporate arts and education? And I think definitely there are some great people working on innovations in art education, but this variety of uses and this, you know, spectrum of understanding, that's not there. I don't know if anybody wants to comment. Uh, any of the panelists want to comment on that? Uh, Tia Hoga? Yes, yeah. I, I would like to comment on that because, you know, uh, for Earth Day, we started a contest, a national contest with schools. And uh, we have schools now from all over the country, Earth Day schools. And the way we are communicating is through a film festival, a, a film festival called Cinema Planeta, which uh, now is 12 years old. Uh, but this year we did it, we did a digital, um, film festival and each film you know is connected to the sustainable development goals it has additional information and we you know we have used a film for environmental education in an incredibly broad way and this year more than ever i mean we had 200,000 participants from from just schools and um so, uh, you know, I think a film is an amazing way of for environmental education and communication. And also what has worked very much has been a uh, street artists uh, expressing uh, the, the specific problem of a place. For example, here in Mexico City in March, we made a huge mural next to the to a very polluted river that crosses right in the middle of Mexico City. So we, we made a huge mural exactly there where the river is. So for the first time, people stopped and looked at it, and then they looked at the river, and only then did they realize how polluted it was. So that started a whole action to clean up the river, for example. So I don't want to take more time, but uh, I think uh, cinema, uh, street art, and of course, recycling, you know, making art objects with recycled plastic paper <laughs> is essential. And when people start uh, doing art with recycled paper or plastic, then they realize how precious, what precious materials they are, you know, how precious a sheet of paper is, how precious a, a bottle is that we otherwise just throw away. So I think when we give value through art, then we realize the importance of, of natural resources. Thank you. Could I add something to that? Is it time for that? Please, please go ahead, Nadine. Please, everybody, just sure. please join and me. I, yeah, we'll go around and listen to all of you. Great. So I just I'd want to thank you again for bringing all the uh, all these different aspects into this work. You know, from my perspective and thinking uh, about why I said yes to be on this little panel was that we, if we're uh, I'm an artist, I'm an activist, I make uh, I'm an organizer, I'm an educator, I'm a practitioner of social justice and nonviolent resistance and civil resistance, the essence for me is really thinking about how do we build people power and how do we build the power as ordinary citizens to work together without resorting to violence against other people to make the change that will enable us to live healthier, more peaceful, more just, more equitable lives. And so whether we're talking about internal transformation and the power of arts and culture in that work or whether we're talking about thinking strategically to wield our power effectively with the limited resources that we have. This is where I think it all hits. And um, the UN and the SDGs, the you know, Sustainable Development Goals and the realization that this old paradigm that we're living in is not of capitalism, of extractive economies, of uh, the, the ways that we're taking from people rather than thinking about the ecosystem services that we need to survive. Uh, this has not solved anything. And as Frederick Douglass said, you know, um, you can't dismantle the master's tools with the master's, the master's house with the master's tools and nothing uh, concedes power without a demand. And so we really, uh, the arts and cultural work really 
integrating that points to how we build effective people power and how we are organized and how we think strategically about what we will need to do to disrupt this old system and birth the new system. Um, and Beautiful Trouble, Beautiful Rising is full of many of these examples of how people are thinking strategically about what the steps are for escalation and innovation. We know that people power is twice as effective or nonviolent campaigns are twice as effective as violent campaigns and art and transformative cultural work is a big piece of how and why people can effectively wield their power in constructive ways and not destructive ways while we disrupt the old system and build the new. And so I just, I just wanna offer that um, as mentioned, as Kathy mentioned, as uh, Gabby mentioned, that these are historical, uh, we have historical, cultural, and innate knowledge that these practices work. And what we have also now is data points that show if we're, we're strategic about how we, how we scale and how we plan our work to integrate uh, collective memory, collective process, collective power, then we can actually make significant change, sometimes in a very short amount of time from the it looks like from the outside whereas the communities have been working for years i'm an environmentalist for the last 40 years i you know we've been working on social justice issues for many many years and all of the giant puppets that i have made or all of the stilt walking that i have done or all of the thing, things i've locked down to stop trans in front of you know these things are all adding up to the moment where of the whirlwind or the moment where we can make significant change because the consciousness is paying attention to it in particular, like we are in that yeah. moment right now of the pandemic. So thank, thank you very you, much. For me. Yeah, I just want to make sure everyone knows, something. both Kathy and Nadine have something to say, and then I'll ask you, Dorota, for some final Kathy, comments Kathy. on artistic practice. So let's yeah. let's uh, round it up. Yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Kathy you were saying right. something very powerful in the chat. If you don't mind building on this, but I really would like to have that showcased as well. And then Gabby, right? And then Julian, yeah. you were saying. May I speak now? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, no, you know, I, I, I totally agree with what Nadine has said. The, the thing for me, coming from the perspective that I come from, which is working in mental health, our mental health system has to change to yeah. community-oriented work for all this to work. All these fabulous programs that everybody's talking about, yes, yes, yes. I mean, my mind's, you know, just going on fire with all this. But this, and, and I'm just speaking about the U.S., but I think there's other places in the world this probably pertains to. I work from a trauma-informed practice stance, which honors culture as one of the basic things. However, trauma-informed work always talks about community. It's never gotten there in our healthcare system in the US where these kinds of things happen in community where they're going to be the most powerful. And that's called healing-centered engagement. That's a relatively new twist to the trauma-informed work, but it's really important. I just got finished writing a book last year, and that was a centerpiece of it because the most powerful change that I've seen, I don't care what group of people I'm working with, whether it's a, a natural disaster and going into their community, uh, working with military and going into their culture, it has to come from those places rather than the traditional psychotherapy office, which is what I've had to operate through quite a bit. I mean, I've stepped out of that, some of my colleagues have, but it's not ingrained in our system yet. And that's where the arts really flourish when you get them into those community settings. So I'm hoping, like Nadine says, there's this change that's going to happen. There's this disruption maybe in the system right now, because I don't think the pandemic has been all bad. I mean, it's terrible that so many people are dying, right? And, you know, there's other things to come here. But I'm hoping when we get to the other side of that, there is a shakedown with all of this system because that will allow that opening, I hope, for these kinds of programs to become more fully mainstream when they've been happening. They're happening. They're happening already, but they haven't been acknowledged within the system. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Gabby, we'll get to you. So you have some remarks you want to add. Sure. Yeah, I think I um, totally agree, but I also think that, uh, as Kathy said, it's happening right now. We have incredible examples in the network. At the Weaving Lab, uh, we collaborate and we are part of several uh, initiatives that are using art to create systemic change in different uh, aspects. Let me give you a few quick examples. If you see in UK, 
the work uh, that Sir Michael Marmot and his team are doing about understanding the social determinants of health and how art can change that social determinants is impressive what they achieve right now. They have a budget uh, from the parliament in UK, programs in the community, and they are investing much more money right now after COVID to extrain the art programs in community because they know the power that arts can have to change the social determinants of health. Actually, uh, yesterday in New Zealand, the prime minister announced uh, an incredible amount of money, I think it was something like 40 billions of dollars for increase the art programs in the school because they realized art programs were the only way to promote creativity and innovation on children. And we had examples like a happiness curriculum in India created from Dream a Dream. And the happiness curriculum is using art to promote all, uh, the social emotional skills in children, but also is working to train the teachers in a more uh, gentle way because sometimes we ask the teachers to do everything and they don't have the training to do it. And I think these kind of examples are uh, very powerful examples and we need to understand how articulate them and also how understand arts, as Mila say, is not only a concentric impact, but it's also interconnected. When you work in your own development, your inner development, you change. The way that you related with the world change, you know, and the, your self-awareness and your ability to understand yourself and your reactions change. And in that particular moment, change the way that you relate with others and the way that you understand others. And in the particular case of in our classroom, when we start to work this with uh, teachers, the teachers realize that they don't need to be an artist because most of the people think I'm not an artist, that is not for me. No, everyone around the world have access to their own creativity. We only need to give them the tools and the pathway to get there. And I start to talk about art in, in a language that other people understand, not only the artists, not only the people in the art sector or in the therapeutic sector, because art is a tool for everyone. Right now we have teachers that uh, teach history using theater, you know, and they don't know anything about theater, but it's a powerful tool to keep children engaged in history who is not uh, uh, a simple signature to teach, you know? There's so many applications and so many examples outside, but I think we need to do like three different level of work here. First one, uh, the individual work and the Dorota work That's, is amazing, you know, to know understand that. But second, we need to understand how to do the social and, uh, and the explanation of, of the art, not only for uh, advocacy or for, uh, you know, give this power to the people, as Nadine say, which is powerful, but also as a tool. And as Cathy say, you know, create the advocacy to have the programs and the budgets to do it in our governments, in our countries, because right now we have an incredible moment to promote that because everybody around the world understand the power, the power of art during the COVID. Not, not, maybe because they are doing mandala to keep their brain <laughs> Uh, health or maybe because they saw what is happening in the global movement but I think that is a great moment to start doing the change. I would love to comment on that. Um, it, thank you so much. I, I really resonate uh, hugely with what you said both Cathy and Gabby um, and I would like to add to that that first of all yes every, every change starts uh, within ourselves, right? But actually, uh, scientifically speaking, uh, the sense of community that Kathy mentioned that is so hugely healing is because it literally, when we gather together, it changes our brain waves. It literally releases five small addictive neurochemical our brain can produce. It puts us in what is called common and flow state that Stephen Kotler and Jamie Will are, sp are speaking about. It, it creates a really a transcendent feeling of us getting, uh, forgetting about ourselves for a moment and being part of something bigger. And when we are even studying blue zones, uh, the three most impo important factors for longevity are 
first of all, sleep, uh, your, how much time you spend externally uh, in, in the sun, and third, sense of community, right, is, is it one of the most important factors of how long and how happy we live. And um, I think that, that uh, what I would love to add to our discussion, because I teach people um, about conscious creativity, and I get a lot of questions about, you know, I'm not an artist, I can't create, I don't understand people who create. Um, and what Gabby said is like every single person is an artist. We are all born creative. We all had imaginary friends when we were little. We all were drawing, you know, and creating castle from sand. And we have to just plug to our inner child in order to go back to that state and basically um, in, uh, rise up and, and, and sort of activate our imagination. And every single person, um, and this is what Chis, uh, Mihai, Tinsen Mihai, speaks about when he teaches creativity, it's every single person has a different type of being creative. Some people um, are creative by the way how they dress and the way they, ma the way they manifest to the world. So other people, how, the way they speak. Um, some of you know the greatest creators and the greatest artists, Gaudi, will look like uh, you know basically baggers on the street, not caring about their look. So our creative expression is very various depending on the person, but we all have it. But what is the most important in creativity and actually artistic expression is that creativity and art can happen other than here in the present moment. We can't be either in the future or in the past in order to create. And putting ourselves into the present moment is exactly what all the practices, including med meditation and mindfulness, are speaking about in order to create a general health and well-being, uh, increase our, um, you know, basically level of happiness and so on. So when we only remember if we can practice that one thing of being in the present moment, we are not only to experience much bigger novelty uh, in our lives because we are going to, to, to see and perceive things differently, look at things in, in a different way, that is going to basically activate you know, ideas and, and insights and downloads of, of uh, maybe the new ways of creating the world, the society, the new way of being and the new way of relating to ourselves. So I think that's, the, that's where we should start. Thank you so much, Dorota. I just want to let everybody know that we had a support system in the background between Julene and I, as I knew she had some internet difficulties. So we were trying to see that she's not frozen and that the con conversation continues. Indeed, you will notice that she's trying to restart things and maybe join us for the final word, but we're holding the ground together. I just want to quickly try to round off the commentaries and give you another round of your insight with one particular correlated question um, and try to address the questions that have been posed in some of the conversations, wonderful conversations in the chat. Ranjani asks here, I'm just going to digest this for us. She's basically asking about how to pursue this, uh, uh, this, these interests and this impact. Granted that as, as, as an example, a friend of hers is a wonderful artist, but he doesn't get enough chance to represent his work in gallery. And apparently between the business of survival and the striving to be creative, we all end up with existential exhaustion. This is all too familiar to me, even personally. Uh, and we are all recognizing that in the world now to be an activist of any kind takes uh, so much time and energy on top of surviving in the world. So that's an individual perspective while at the same time we told and others in the chat room were asking, you know, how do we activate this in the larger social field? What I've noticed in the discussions between Julene and I as we've been working together over the course of a couple of years now, is that we realize towards the global leadership that can sustain individuals in the midst of this exhaustion and economic distress, right? Uh, Psycho-emotional, socioeconomic distress, uh, and to actually pitch us forward collectively, culture and art are the integrative practices and are the actual interface where all these different sectors of human activity, whether that's governance or economy or education on science and technology or civic movements, or that is the way to come together. And that's a key thing that we have 
means of inner technology and external expression and, and community binding that art and culture provide uh, to be the interface uh, collective and also integral practice. So between the individual struggle and the collective struggle, I am wanted to ask you in the spirit of the World Academy who is trying through this project to find new ways of connecting these practices and new ways of convening these practices. And you can see there's a wealth of these, uh, there's a spectrum of practices that we've all shared today. And I invite you to, to uh, unapologetically share your multitude of identities and practices and, and activities. What we have noticed is there's a lack of connecting and showcasing these extraordinary best practices that have become a counterbalance to quite violent media. That's what we need. So in the spirit of all of this, uh, whether through the chat questions uh, or what we have exchanged amongst ourselves, what is the way I would like each of you to take a turn and tell us in practical ways how and, and what is the way, what are the fastest ways in which we accelerate and scale out these practices for impact? Uh, Kathy, would you like to begin? You are muted, please. I'm muting. I'm unmuting. <laughs> well, you know, while you were saying that, I mean, I can only speak from what I do in the world, right? So Absolutely. what I do in the world is educate. And, you know, through programming, I'm not going to be an advertiser here about what that is exactly, but it's institute training for not only people that are in my realm of mental health and trying to apply the arts, it's also for artists, coaches, uh, even first responders take the mm -hmm. courses because what I'm trying to get across to as many people as possible is how the expressive arts need to infiltrate again on that community level. It can't just stay in an office. It can't just stay in a certain realm or space that it's been traditionally in. It has to get out into the streets literally in some way. But people need those skill sets to understand what that is. And then through working with them and working you know, through coursework and supervision and all these different kinds of ways we get together, how do we get that programming out there? I think you have to have a network of people to support that. And, and what's Fair come enough. of that over the last 10 years has been pretty remarkable with people around the world in India and Asia and Australia and Africa taking these models uh, that I've been talking about and putting it into things like Gabby is doing, exactly what Gabby is doing in her work. So that support system has to be there somehow, but that, that's my way of doing it is mentoring and education. Can I uh, call on Tia Hoga and while she's talking, I am going to support something here for you. If you can see my screen, I'm supporting what you called for earlier, recycling that is by way of repurposing. This is a initiative called Lentfield Harmonic. Please look them up. These are children that are using recycled materials and to play extraordinary music on it. So this is just to showcase another initiative in the world out there. But Tia Hoga, do you mind sharing with us what um, you, know, you think are concrete things that we can do to accelerate and scale out these practices that we find so effective? Uh, well, I, I totally agree with Kathy. I mean, the basis of all is education and communication. And uh, I think we are uh, right now, I mean, this whole COVID crisis is putting like all of humanity in the learning process, you know? <laughs> we are all communicating through this incredible technology um, that wasn't there before. And I think as a humanity, we are in a huge evolution of our minds and of our technology and of our understanding of cultures and of nature. And um, I am just amazed because I, th I think the learning process of these last three months in which we have direct communication, which we don't have otherwise. And I think we are also maximizing our time, you know, because we don't have to move. We don't, we, 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 we are just where we are learning and talking and communicating and creating. 
And I think that the biggest creative process we can work on right now is on a new way of learning in a very creative way. You know, we, we, we have to jump into like a new dimension of how we learn and uh, to learn much faster because uh, somehow from an environmental point of view, you know, I think we really don't have time. You know, if we think that we have only 10 more years in which we really can make a change in the world to, to, to enter into a, more, into a sustainable world that can really assure a, a future, at least for humanity and all the other species, we have to learn very fast. We have to grow very fast. We have to be very creative. And uh, we have to put all our resources together in, in this process. Thank you so much. Nadine, uh, be mindful of time as well. Why don't you go ahead? And then I'm going to ask for Dorota and then Gabby in that order to round off this wonderful conversation. Yeah, I want to thank everybody. I mean, I think uh, all of this is valuable. There's no, you know, as an artist, as an activist, as an organizer, as an educator, I believe in the power of education and arts and culture to do this, to make the essential change of the world. I mean, what has changed the world is people changing themselves and changing their small communities and then scaling up. And so from my perspective, where I sit now, it's all really important to make sure that we build the communication networks and we cross the barriers to build re relationships. I love this idea of the framing of thinking of leadership as a solution generation approach. We don't say, I don't work in groups that have hierarchical leadership anymore. We don't have leaders per se. What we have is leaderful movements and the lack of the communities looking at our movements and saying, oh, they don't have any leaders. There's no leaders. It means that they just don't understand the paradigm shift that we are all leaders and we are doing training and support that's necessary to build leadership across the board so that everyone can put in place the solutions that are appropriate for their own context. Scale is one the, the absolute disregard for human-based scale, and that needs to be defined by yourself, is one of the reasons why we're in such a problem, whether you're talking about energy selection, like the fossil fuel industry is not appropriate all over the world. And the scale that we use there is problematic as we were talking about environmental. Solar is not a scalable solution for everywhere in the world. You might use solar one place and hydrothermal and uh, other things in other places. And it also relates to the, how we solve our emotional and psychological and educational problems. And we must take all this into account in the bigger picture of how we use these transformational tools to really build people power because without it, we cannot do what we want, which is force the government to actually put their money where they're, where they're put their resources in supporting what we think is critical. We can't change how the police is funded unless we have support to do that. We can't actually put in place arts education at every level and transformative practices. So yes, it's a yes and, it's all really important. And I advocate for thinking about how to make civil how to make revolution irresistible internally externally and across the boundaries so i really do think that it's the right approach for the un if we want to move the sustainable development goals this is a clear winner way to do it so thank you for having this panel thank you so much nadine dorota unmute yourself please yes um i think i the problem right now is not that those transformative tools are not there. They are there. They are just not available to everyone. And pe most of people, they, they, first of all, they don't have a knowledge. So that's why education is so important. But, but also they don't have access. And I've been in the industry for many years that, that is very elitist. That is for selected or, you know, richer people. And, and I've been always really uh, passionate uh, about how we can scale it. And my really big dream is to, um, you know, first of all, uh, use better art gallery spaces that in my opinion are underutilized and are extremely elitist um, in order to give people those experiences that maybe can combine uh, technology, can combine uh, therapy, can combine all sort of uh, meditative practices together in order 
to help people to, to really um, learn something new about themselves. If I can go and have access to a public gallery space where within an hour I will experience technology and practices and, and different, learn different things that are up there even, um, that already helps me to not only have more knowledge, but also uh, experience things I never, I never did before, which is for me the first step to transformation. So that, that is really my, my, my dream to create a new movement. You know, we had a Dadaism, we had, we had a Kubism. How about transformational art movement? And really motivate those artists to create transformational art. So um, I would love to see that. And, but secondly, um, I'm very passionate about how we can change uh, awareness of people. And that is through, how, and how we can educate people through art, uh, which you all spoke about uh, um, a little bit. And I actually found a few amazing examples that I would love to share if I have one minute. Um, it can be really brief because I'm getting also uh, invitations to round off, but right. by all means. Ah. <laughs> Movement of advertising. It's never enough, yeah movements of advertising that are really powerful in changing our perception, right? Those things can go viral. That helps actually people to learn about certain uh, perceptions that are there and, and actually question themselves, right? A amazing advertising um, created by that. Another amazing uh, advertising and had by United uh, um, Colors of Benetton. Uh, uh, well, UN woman, uh, one of the most powerful advertising I I've seen that make us questioning the, 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 the use of internet, the use of, of um, research and, and, and Google. Uh, you have different examples of, of ecology and ecology related advertising, which are very powerful. Uh, these are another few. Um, society of consumption that just images like that just make us question things and that's the first step for transformation um advertising against violence very powerful um children i went to feel invisible i mean shocking right but we need those emotion and we need to be shocked in order to react in order to act and to create something different advertising uh, about homeless people um, and it, it, is, it is really, I don't know if you feel it, but it's really deep. It really right. emotions, right? This is what we need in order to transform. We need to, we need to shake people and we need to make them wake up. And mm -hmm. art is one of the most powerful uh, tools in order to do it. And you have another dub advertising. I, I won't be uh, showing that because we don't have a time. Yes, but you get my point. It's basically let's use it in order to inform people, change people's perception, change people's awareness about things. Gabby, please. Thank you, Derek. I think it's great because I am a truly believer of the power of art to wake up people. But also, I think we need to le learn how to understand art as a way to change our behaviors. Not only how be we believe about things or our perception about the world also the thing that we act because it doesn't matter if i see the advertising if i don't change the way i act or if i don't change the way i treat the refugees or if i don't change the way that i am consuming that doesn't that make sense and arts have a lot of tools to change the way that we work to break the patterns of our uh, behaviors and for me in the last 10 years, the major discovery has been in art sector, it's very difficult to bring the topic of education or social change because artists and galleries and philanthropists are not interested in that. In the educational sector, it's very difficult to talk about art because most of the teachers think that is for artists or for little children in preschool. And in the social sector, when you talk about art, everybody say, no, that is beautiful, but don't make changes. And when you find the right examples to prove people that is not true, you know, and we have thousands of examples around the world. You know, I know for personally children who save their life through art, you know, right now they should be a drug dealers and they are photographers. And that is more powerful to any advertising or any other uh, convene that we can do. We need to showcase that examples 
and we need to put these people to talk. The people from artist sector, the artists, the galleries, the creators, with the teachers, with the principals, with the policymakers in education, and the people who is working in the social sector. When we understand that, and we give the value the, uh, the art have in a holistic way, just in that moment, we can create systemic change. Otherwise, we are going to continue as a silos, working each one in their own passion. I'm not an artist, but I am married with an artist. And we learn working together that he can create everything. But if we can put it on place, that don't create change. The only way to create change is we take what he creates and we put it on service of others. And we need, and of course, not every art has to be transformational or social art. But if we want to use art to create systemic change, we need to understand how to make art simple, understandable, aceable for the people and to create behavioral changes and mindset changes. Thank you so much. With this, we conclude uh, only in order to begin together. I expect from this communication and this convening that there's only many collaborations to come in the spirit of also what Kathy was calling for networking and expanding our communities. Um, and I will first of all want to thank you all on behalf of Julene and myself. I also want to thank you for staying with us to all the attendees as well. And particularly, I want to say many thank yous to our tireless and endlessly patient, brilliant support team in the World Academy of Art and Science that is present there and supporting this platform for us to share. And to conclude with what I've heard from all of you, which is an array of practices and methodologies through which to accelerate and scale this out, all meaningful and powerful. What we understand, it seems, is that we are not lacking knowledge. Where we experience loss of knowledge is where we're lacking collaboration. So this is the aim of this project, Global Leadership in the 21st Century, to gather us, gather us and get us in a place, convene us in a place to collaborate and multiply exponentially the effect of our own individual practices in our own uh, um, communities as well. Um, Self-expression is a birthright, is a human right. Education is human right. Arts and participation in culture and social processes is human right. And as such, we also exemplified here today ways in which we can empower individuals to in fact uh, generate social change through their own self-expression and applying themselves and self-giving themselves in the world to expand in identities and identifications in an empathic way. I guess that is the key here. I thank you all. Uh, here our collaborations begin, and I hope to see you in our next session on culture and transformation, where we can zoom out on these processes exactly on a larger and deeper scale. Uh, stay safe and uplifted and keep on creating, and my best to all of you on behalf of Julene and myself and the World Academy. Thank you all.